So in this video, we're looking at a solutions to a college final exam that I've given in the past. The first question says use matrices to solve the following system of equations. We're going to go and write our matrix. So our matrix, we're going to use the coefficients in front of our variables and then our constant. We're making sure all of our x terms are lined up in one column, all the y terms are lined up in another, z, and so forth. And so for our first row, we have one, then we have negative one. There's no z value or term in that first equation, so zero. Then our vertical line, or you might see sometimes, which I think was on your exam, was dotted line in here, or dashed line, six. So the second equation, our coefficients are two, zero, negative three, and then 16. Our third row, we don't have an x term, so we have a 0, 2, 1, and 4. So we're always working column to column. First column, we want a 1 in the first row, first column, which there is. We're going to use that row to get rid of the entries below. So if we look at a negative 2 times row 1 and add it to row 2, we're going to get a 0 where we want it right here. I'm just going to rewrite the rows that I'm not changing. 1, negative 1, 0, 6. I'm not changing row 3, so 0, 2, 1, 4. I'm changing my row 2. So negative 2 times this 1 is negative 2, plus 2 is 0. Negative 2 times this negative 1 is positive 2, plus 0 is 2. Negative 2 times this 0 is 0, plus negative 3 is negative 3. And negative 2 times 6 is negative 12, plus 16 is 4. So looking at this, I now want to get a 1 in this row. So I want a 1 in the second row, second column. So it looks like that we're only way that we can make this to a 1 is to multiply 1 half times row 2. So our first row is the same, 1, negative 1, 0, 6. Our second row, so 1 half times 0 is 0. 1 half times 2 is 1. 1 half times negative 3 halves is negative, or sorry, 1 half times negative 3 is negative 3 halves. And 1 half times this 4 here gives me 2. Rewriting my row 3, 0, 2, 1, and 4. So now I'm going to use that one that we just made, and we're going to use that to get rid of the entries above and below this one. And so I notice if I add row two plus row one, this one minus one gives me a zero where I want it. So I'm going to rewrite my row two. I'm just using that to manipulate and get rid of the entries above and below that one. So we have 0, 1, negative 3 halves, and 2 for our second row. Our first row is now going to become, so I have row 2 plus row 1. So 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. Negative 3 halves plus 0 is negative 3 halves. And I have 2 plus 6, which gives us 8. I now need to get this 2 down below that 1 to be 0. So if we look at negative 2, row 2, and add it to row 3, that would give us a 0 where we want it. So 0 times negative 2 is 0, plus 0 is 0. Negative 2 times 1 is negative 2, plus 2 is 0. Negative 2 times negative 3 halves. The 2s are going to cancel. Multiplying two negatives is positive, so that gives me positive three plus one gives me four. Negative two times this two is negative four plus four gives me zero. 
So I could stop here. I could read off solutions looking at this, or I could continue on. I at least want to make this a one here. So let's do one fourth times row three. So one fourth times row three. Well, one fourth times zero is zero. One fourth times zero is zero. One fourth times four is one. And one fourth times zero again is zero. Rewriting my other rows because I'm not changing them right now. So again, I, we could stop here and we could read the solution and for the last row, and then we can do substitution or we can continue use this leading one we just made and get rid of the entries above. Let's just go ahead and do that. So let's look at if we multiply three halves times row three and add it to row one, that would get rid of this negative three halves. So doing so, we have one, zero, because zero plus one is one, zero plus zero is zero. Three halves times one is three halves, minus three halves is zero. Three halves times this zero is zero, plus eight is eight. Now I'm gonna look at this three halves times row three plus row two. So zero times zero is, I'm sorry, three halves times zero is zero plus zero is zero. Three halves times zero is zero plus one is one. Three halves times one is three halves plus a negative three halves is zero. Three halves times zero is zero plus two is two. Last row, zero, zero, one, zero. So reading this off, our first row says that X is equal to eight. Y is equal to, for our second row, two and z is equal to zero. So we can always go back and check our solution. If we plug in those values for x, y, and z into each equation, it has to work for each of these equations, and you plug it in, you get a true statement, then it is a solution. So let's just check it really quick. x minus y, eight minus two, is that six? Yes. 2 times x, so 2 times 8 is 16. I'm going to just write it here. Um, negative 3 times z. Negative 3 times 0 is 0. So 16 equals 0. That's right. And then the last row, 2 times y, so 2 times 2 is 4, plus z, which is 0. 4 plus 0 is 4, and that is correct also. So we found the correct solutions to that system of equations using matrices. For our next question, we have another system of equations. This time it's not linear. If we have a system of equation that are non-linear, we cannot use matrices. Um, so looking at this, it says graph each equation of the system, then solve the system to find the point of intersection or intersections. It could be more than one. If we look at this, you should know what the shapes of those look like. The first one, we have y equals the square root of x. And so I know that this looks kind of like a halfway sideways parabola. So this is y is equal to the square root of x. The other equation, it's almost in the form y equals mx plus b. I could rewrite it as y is equal to negative x plus 6. So there I can see I have a y-intercept at 6. Um, and then I have a slope of negative 1. So if I go down 1 over 1 to the right, go down 1 over 1 to the right, etc. Since I did not plot these points, I might be a little off. So let me just plot a couple points for y equals the square root of x. So at 0, I have 0. 1 squared to 1 is 1. I'm going to choose the things that I can do. Square root of 4 is 2. Something like this more. 
So down one over one to the right, down one over one to the right. So at six, we'll be crossing. Not the best graph. Let's see if I can pull this up. Let's just make my point a little better. Okay. So looking at this, it looks like it's intersecting just once. And we can see where the point of intersection is. And we can use that value um, once we solve for it algebraically to see if it looks correct. So looking at this, there's a couple ways that we can approach this. Um, well, actually there's only one way that, we, actually no, there's two ways. <clears throat> no, there's one way. <laughs> um, looking at this, it looks like I'm gonna do substitution. So I'm gonna take the square root of x, y equals square root of x, and I'm gonna rewrite what y is in terms of x. So the square root of x is equal to six minus x. Okay, so here's an equation, a type that we have seen at the beginning of the semester, solving equations with radicals. Um, in that case, we would isolate our radical, which this is already done, and then we would get rid of that radical, in this case, by squaring both sides of our equation. Be careful squaring the right-hand side. I'm not going to just square each term because there's subtraction in between the terms. So square root of x squared is just x equals, I'm going to take 6 minus x times 6 minus x. So I have x is equal to 6 times 6 is 36. My middle term, I'm going to have a negative 6x minus another 6x is minus 12x. And then negative x times negative x gives me plus x squared. I notice we have a quadratic equation, so I want to set this equal to zero. As I set it equal to zero, I'm going to subtract x on both sides, but as I'm doing that, I'm going to rewrite this in descending order of powers. So I have zero is equal to x squared, negative 12x minus x is minus 13x, and then plus 36. So I would see if I can factor this, well, nine times um, 4 is 36, and 9 plus 4 is 13. So if I factor this as x minus 4, x minus 3, I'm sorry, x minus 4, x minus 9. Um, looking at this, I have x minus 4 is equal to 0, I get x equals 4. Looking at when x minus 9 is equal to 0, I get x is equal to 9. Well, let's go back and see if these, what these values are if we plug them back in, because this is the x value. So when x is equal to 4, plug that in, we get that y is equal to the square root of 4. So y is equal to 2. I have a solution at 4, 2. But if I look at this, 1, 2, 3, 4 and then up to. So that looks like where we're intersecting there. Now let's look at when x is 9. So if we plug that in, we get the square root of 9, which is 3. We should actually be looking at the other equation too to make sure we get the same result. Um, I do when x was 4, 6 minus 4 is 2. Um, but if I plug in 9 for x into the second equation, I would get y is equal to 6 minus 9. So y is equal to negative 3. These are not the same number when I plug them back into both equations. 
And so there's not a solution for the value of x equals 9. Our next problem is in front of us. We're going to graph the system of inequalities, and we're going to find the points of intersections. Looking at this, looking at my equations, I see that both equations are conic sections. I can see that the first equation, x squared plus y squared, if it said equals 16, that is a circle with a radius of 4 and a center of 0, 0. So from my center 0, 0, I'm going to go to the left 4, to the right 4, up 4, and down 4. I'm going to draw my circle the best I can. So for my this, it was less than or equal to, so it should be a solid line when we're making that graph. Um, it's less than or equal to, so it looks like I'm going to be shading inside of the circle. And I can test that by choosing a point inside the circle and making sure that that's a true statement. So if I plugged in 0, 0 here, I get 0 squared plus 0 squared. Is that less than 16? Yeah. So that told me I chose the rec cor correct region to shade. So now looking at this second equation, I can tell that it's a parabola. Why, if I looked at y equals x squared minus 4, and it's a parabola, it shifted down 4 units. Um, I know I'm passing at 2, x equals 2, negative 2. So we have a graph here looking at this and the intersections. Um, it looks like there's three points of intersection. And this one was, we're grading everything greater than or equal to. Um, x squared minus 4. So let's check again. Let's choose if we plugged in 0, 0 inside of this parabola shape, would that be a true statement? Is 0 greater than 0 squared minus 4? Is 0 bigger than or equal to negative 4? No, that's a false statement here. So instead of shading inside of the parabola, we're shading outside of the parabola. So our solution set are everything which they have in common when we're shading, which would be kind of these crescent shapes in here. Plus the line on the shape or the graph because of the equal to part included. So now let's go through and look at our solutions. Looking at this, let's see. Let's rewrite it so that we have all the x or all the variables on one side of our equation, which we already do for the first equation, x squared plus y squared. I'm going to say equals 16. And then we're looking at, I'm going to subtract x squared on both sides of the second inequality. So I get negative x squared plus y is equal to negative 4. Notice if we sum these two equations now, our x squared terms will fall away, and we'll be just left with an equation within terms of y. So x squares cancel. I get y squared plus y is equal to 16 minus 4, which is 12. Quadratic, so I want to set it this equal to 0. Let's subtract 12 on both sides. And so we get y squared plus y minus 12 equals 0. And then let's factor. So our, our two numbers that multiply to give us our constant negative 12 and add to give us 1. 
which are positive four and negative three. So looking at this, we have y is equal to negative four and y is equal to three. So those are the y values of my solution. I wanna find the x values of my solution. And so let's make, we can either look at the first equation or the second equation. If we looked at our first equation, about y equals negative x squared minus four. So if I plugged in negative four for y there, I get negative four equals x squared minus four. Add four to both sides. I end up getting x squared equals zero. Take the square root of both sides, I get plus or minus the square root of zero. So x is zero. So I have a point at zero, negative four, which if we looked at our graph, that was one of our points on there. And now looking at when y is negative three. So again, plugging it back into the second equation, we have negative three is equal to x squared minus four. Let's get x squared by itself and use the square root method. We can't always use the square root method on quadratic equations, only if it's in a particular form, which this is. So if I add four to both sides, I get x squared equals one. Take the square root of both sides. Don't forget that plus or minus in front of the radical when you take the square root of both sides of an equation. So we get x is plus or minus one. Something's off with my graph. Okay, so I, I could tell that something was off with my, my graph. And if we go back over here, and that, that happens sometimes when you're working through a math problem, right? You make a little error, but a lot of times you should be finding those errors as you're working through because you might get a contradiction like what I was getting here. Um, and so looking back at this equation, y should be positive three, not negative three. So now let's change that to positive three. Now if I add four to both sides, I get three plus four is seven. So I get x is the square root of plus or minus 7. And so my solution, there's two solutions. I have negative root 7, 3, and positive root 7, 3. which lines up more of where this intersection is. I knew I had y intercepts at, or x intercepts at negative two, two. And so with getting y one, I knew that that was impossible, but this is possible. So we got our points of intersection and we graphed our solutions to that system of inequalities. Our next problem, on the exam is find the partial fraction decomposition of the rational expression x plus 2 all over x cubed minus 2x squared plus x. So first thing that you want to do when you're looking at the partial fraction decomposition is look at the degree of the numerator and degree of the denominator. If the degree of the denominator is larger, then it's a proper fraction and we can just go through and factor the denominator. And in this case, it's proper. If the degree were the same, or if the degree of the numerator was larger, then we would use long division and then just use partial fraction decomposition on the remainder piece. But that's not the case for the example in front of us. So let's start by factoring that denominator. Our numerator is the same, x plus 2, all over. I notice I can pull an x out of all three of those terms. Let's just do that here. If I pull an x out of all three of those terms, I'm left with x squared minus 2x plus 1. And then I notice this x squared minus 2x plus 1 also factors as x minus 1 times x minus 1, or x minus 1 quantity squared. So this is equal to. So depending on what type of factor we have in the denominator, is it linear, 
is it a repeating linear? Is it quadratic or is, and that quadratic would be irreducible. And is it a repeating irreducible quadratic? Well, I notice they're both linear. One is repeating and one is not. So to rewrite our fractions as a sum, we would have a over our first linear x plus b over our other factor x minus one plus c because x minus one repeats itself, we would have x minus one squared. And I would continue on until I got up to the number of factors there were, which in this case we already did. So now let's clear our fractions. We can clear our fractions and we did this before. Solving equation, rational equations at the beginning of the semester. So we can clear our fractions here. Let's just multiply both sides of the equation by our least common denominator which is x all times x minus one quantity squared. So when we distribute this on the left-hand side of our equation, our denominator cancels, leaving us with a numerator, x plus two, equals, when we distribute this to the first term on the right-hand side, that single x is gonna cancel, and we're left with a all times x minus one, quantity squared, distributing to the second term on the right-hand side, grouping that one of the x minus ones are going to cancel. And so we're left with b all times x times an x minus one, plus distributing it to the last grouping on the right-hand side, the x minus one quantity squared cancels leaving us with c times x. So let's go ahead and expand this through on the right-hand side. So I have a all times x minus 1 quantity squared is x squared minus 2x plus 1. Plus, let's distribute this bx to both terms. So bx times x is bx squared bx times negative 1 gives me minus bx plus cx. So bring on the x plus 2. Now let's distribute that a. So we get ax squared minus 2ax plus a. Bringing down the remaining terms plus bx squared minus bx plus cx. Okay, so I don't have an x squared term on the left-hand side, so I can think of this as 0x squared plus. So my coefficient in front of the x squared term on the left-hand side is 0. This is equal to the sum of the coefficients on the right-hand side. So that would be a plus b, terms in front of, coefficients in front of the x squared. So now looking at the coefficient in front of x, which is 1, is equal to, so let's just look at the terms that just have a single x here. So this is equal to negative 2a minus b plus c. And the last one, our constant is 2. This is equal to our constant on the other side, which is just a. So <clears throat> when you guys work through this, I had you to use matrices. It was possible for you to do to solve. Um, so we could use matrices here if you want, or we can just go back and do direct substitution since we know that A is equal to two. If we substitute that back into the first equation, we get zero equals two plus B. So then B would have to be negative two. So now if we go back in and we substitute in what A is and what B is into the third equation, we would get one is equal to negative two times A, which is two, minus B, so minus negative two plus C.
So we have one is equal to negative four plus two plus C. One is equal to negative four plus two is negative two plus C. So C is equal to three. So let's go back. We can rewrite what this partial fraction decomposition is. So the sum of simpler fractions by plugging it in those coefficients. So we have this is equal to a, which is 2, all over x, plus b, b is negative 2, so minus 2, all over x minus 1, plus c, so plus 3, all over x minus 1, quantity squared. So number five says for four, for four x, for f of x equals x squared minus x plus two, we want to find that the difference quotient f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Okay, so if you need to, you can plug this into pieces and then plug it in. If we're looking at f of x plus h, we're plugging in x plus h wherever we see an x in our f of x function. And so doing so here, we have x plus h, quantity squared, minus, but parentheses, x plus h, and our parentheses, plus 2. So that's just for the first piece of the numerator. Let's expand this out, because we're going to need to anyways. And so x plus h times x plus h is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Let's distribute that negative inside the parentheses so we get minus x minus h plus 2. If I'm looking at minus f of x, I'm looking at multiplying negative 1 to all of the terms in f of x, so negative parentheses x squared minus x plus 2. Distributing that negative 1, we get negative x squared plus x minus 2. So let's put this all together. So we have f of x plus h, which we saw was x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus x minus h plus 2 minus f of x, which we saw was negative x squared plus x minus 2 all over our h value. So let's go back here and let's simplify by combining like terms. Things are going to start canceling on our numerator. We have an x squared minus an x squared cancels. We have a 2 minus a 2 cancels. A negative x plus an x cancels. So notice that all the terms that we're left with in the numerator, they all have an h in there. So I'm going to pull out an h as I rewrite my numerator from all of those three terms left. So pulling an h out of this 2xh, I'm left with 2x. Plus pulling an h out of h squared, I'm left with an h. Minus pulling an h out of negative h, I'm left with a minus 1. All over h. Our h is canceled. And we're left with... 2x plus h minus 1. So that's the difference quotient of our f of x function given. Okay, so looking at the graph, answer the following questions. So where's the graph increasing? Where's the graph decreasing? So I'm looking at all the x values where our graph is increasing and all the x values where our graph is decreasing. When I'm looking at where it's increasing or decreasing, I'm reading the graph from left to right, and I'm seeing where am I going if I was walking left to right? Would I be walking uphill or downhill? And so the first piece of my graph here, I see that I'm decreasing until I hit negative 8. So I'm decreasing from negative infinity to negative 8, my x value. I'm also decreasing here from negative 6. 2 to x equals 0, so union negative 2 to 0. 
I'm also decreasing going down left to right, starting when x is 2, going until x is 5. So the other places, I'll be going up. So this is from negative 8 to negative 2. So it's increasing from negative 8 to negative 2. And then it's also increasing from 0 to 2, and then 5 to infinity. Looking at what the range is, the range are all the y values we're hitting on the graph. I notice that we do have an absolute min, so the smallest y value that we're hitting on this graph is when y is negative 4. I'm including that, so I'm going to put a bracket here. And then I'm hitting all the y values because this graph is extending as x goes to infinity, y is going to positive infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, y is also going to positive infinity. So I'm hitting all my y values greater than or equal to negative four. It's another way to write that. Is that in a quality notation? So where are local max and mins occurring and what are their values? So local max and local mins can occur at our peaks or our valleys, or if this was on a closed interval, it could occur at our endpoints, but this is not on a closed interval, so we're not going to have that. If I'm looking for my mins, it's occurring when x is negative 8, and my y value is the min, which is negative 4. So I have a min of negative 4, but I'm just going to put my point negative 8, negative 4. I have a min at 0, 0. And I have a min at 5, 0. So these are points and not interval notation like we have above. What we had above was interval notation. So you need to be careful and know if we're talking about points or interval notation. If I'm looking for my maximum values, my peaks, I'm going to have a max at x equals negative 2, which is 6. So at the point, negative 2, 6. And when x is 2, my max value is 10. So the point 2, 10 is a max. Next part is I want to know when is f of x greater than 0. So I want to know when is this graph above the x-axis. Well, there's multiple places where this is above the x-axis. where it's touching the x-axis, that's not above the x-axis. If I had the equal to part for my inequality, I would include that part in my solution, but I don't, so I'm not going to include it. So <clears throat> my graph is greater than zero from negative infinity to negative 10, but not including negative 10, so parentheses. Union, starting at negative five, but not including negative five to zero, not including zero. Union, zero to 5, not including 5, union 5 to infinity. So the last piece says, from what we learned in class, what can you tell me about this polynomial? The degree, leading coefficient, multiplicity of zeros, and behaviors justify your answer. So I'm going to talk through this. I'm not going to write through it just to save some time. And so what do we know? Let's look at count at the number of turns. So if we have a degree n polynomial, it has at most n minus one turns. So if I look at the number of turns, the most that degree could be would be n plus one. So looking at this, I have one turn here, a turn here, a turn here, a turn here, and a turn here. So we have one, two, three, four, five turns. So that's where it's changing from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. And so the maximum um, degree 
is six. Looking at my end behaviors of my graph, they're going in the same direction. They're both shooting off to positive infinity. So this tells me that my degree is even. Because they're going to positive infinity and I'm raising my X value as I go to positive infinity and negative infinity to an even number that's positive. I want my Y value to be positive. So I know my leading coefficient, the coefficient is positive. It's bigger than one, or it's bigger than zero. And then let's talk about our zeros of, of our polynomial function and the multiplicity of those zeros. We know that if we're crossing the x-axis, that the multiplicity of that zero is odd. If we're just touching the x-axis, that multiplicity of that zero is even. And so I'm gonna count the least amount. So we're crossing at negative 10. So the least that zero could be would be multiplicity one. I'm crossing here at negative two or negative five. So multiplicity here would be one. I'm touching at zero. So the, the smallest multiplicity that factor could be would be two. Counting here, we're touching at x equals five. So it's an even multiplicity. The least it could be would be multiplicity two. So if I sum one plus one plus two plus two, I get that this is equal to six. So the smallest degree this could be by touching or crossing would be degree six. But by the number of turns, we saw that the maximum degree was six. So from this, we know our degree is six. So we've gone through, looked at the graph of our polynomial and did some reasoning to give us information about that polynomial function. So number seven says, graph the equation x squared plus four x plus four y squared minus eight y plus four equals zero. So looking at this equation, I notice I have an x squared and a y squared term. I know this is a conic section because I have x squared, y squared that narrows it down to a circle, ellipse, or hyperbola. So looking at the coefficients in front of my x squared, y squared, I can tell if it's gonna be a circle, the coefficients would be the same but my coefficient is one here and four here, not the same, so it's not a circle. If it's an ellipse, they're gonna be different numbers in front of x squared, y squared, which they are, and they would have the same sign. They'd be both either be positive or both negative, and they're both positive here, so I know I have an ellipse. My ellipse equation, I know that the standard form and what I can tell information about it is x minus h quantity squared all over a squared plus y minus k quantity squared all over b squared, this is equal to one. So I want to rewrite this so all my x terms are together, all my y terms are together, all my constants are on the other side, and I'm gonna complete the square of my x and y terms. So I have x squared plus four x plus, I'll leave a spot here, to make that a perfect square. Plus, in order to complete the square, that coefficient in front of the square has to be one. So we need to pull the four out of both of those y terms. So I have four all times the quantity y squared minus two y. I'm gonna add something here to make this a perfect square is equal to Let's subtract four on both sides. So negative four plus whatever we added on the left-hand side of the equation. So to add, to make this x squared plus four x a perfect square, we're gonna take four divided by two. So that's two and square that number, two squared is four. So I'm gonna add four to both sides to make that a perfect square. We need to be careful on the next one because we have four times 
this number we're adding inside the parentheses. So looking at what we're adding inside the parentheses, half of negative two, which is negative one, square negative one, I get one. And so let's rewrite these as perfect squares. X squared plus four X plus four is the same thing as X plus two quantity squared plus four times Y squared minus two Y plus one. We can rewrite as Y minus one quantity squared is equal to negative four plus four cancels plus four times one, which is four. Standard form of an ellipse or a hyperbola is set equal to one. So let's divide everything through by one. And so we have x plus two quantity squared all over four plus y minus one quantity squared. I'm gonna just put it over one, but I don't have to, is equal to one. So I can tell what my center is. It's hk, so it's negative two, one. So let's plot that. I'm gonna go over to the left, and I'm gonna go up one. My largest number in the denominator is four. It's underneath the x. So I know that it's my major axis is parallel to the x-axis. And my a value is two. I'm gonna to go to the left two and to the right two. My minor axis, my b value, b squared is one. So b is one. We're gonna go up one and down one. So going up one, down one, We have our ellipse here. Not down one, I really think. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my tick marks are throwing me off a little bit. So it looks like, looks something like that. It's not symmetrical, but it should be. So in looking at our next question, number eight, we have find the equation of the hyperbola, describe the graph of the equation. We're given that the center of the hyperbola is negative three, negative four. We're given the focus is at negative three, negative eight, and we have a vertex at negative three, negative two. So in order for me to know or to figure out what direction my hyperbola is facing, is it facing up or, and down, or is it facing left and right? I can go through here and I can plot my points and kind of determine by where my points are, which one that would be. And so let's plot my center, which is at negative three, negative four. I'm going to go left three, down four. My foci is negative three, negative eight. So I'm going to go left three, down eight. And I have a vertex at negative three, negative two. Okay, so I know my foci here is on my transverse axis. I know my hyperbola shapes are going towards the foci. Um, and so my foci and the center, so this would be going up and down. So for our formula, up and down, it's going to be my y value that's negative. So I'm going to have x minus h quantity squared all over a squared minus y minus k quantity squared all over b squared equals 1. I know my center. And so my h value oops, is negative 3. And my k value is negative 4. But if I look at x minus a negative, that's really x plus. 
So right now I have x plus 3 quantity squared over a squared minus parentheses y minus a negative 4. So y plus 4 quantity squared over b squared equals 1. So looking at this, I know that I'm going up from my center to my vertices. I'm going up two units. The length of that transverse axis is two, in this case, let me just look at this real quick. Yeah, it was, I was off a little bit. It's because it's going up and down. It's the y value that's positive and the next the y, x value that's a negative. So we're just going to change this to plus, minus, minus, plus. And so this value here, b is 2. I'm going up 2. I would go down 2 from the center to get my vertice. This was a little off. So my b value is equal to 2. So b squared is 4. In this case, I have that c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. I know that my c value from my center to my foci, that is what c is. So from negative 4 to negative 8, that length in here is 4. So I know c is equal to 4. So I have 4 squared is equal to a squared plus b squared, but b squared we found was 4. So we get 16 is equal to a squared plus 4. Subtract 4 on both sides, we get a squared equals 12. Well, that's what I need for my equation is a squared. I could find a, but I don't need to. So let's rewrite our equation. We have it now. I'm going to rewrite it where the positive piece is first. So y plus 4 quantity squared over b squared, which we found to be 4, minus x plus 3 quantity squared all over a squared, which we found to be 12, is equal to 1. So given information about a conic section, so given points of the graph or point and information about the graph, graphing it first kind of is helpful to get what kind of form that standard form of that conic section should be in. The next example or next question, number nine, says list the five terms of the sequence. We're given the first term is three, and we're given the nth term is two thirds times a sub n minus one. So if I'm looking at n equals 2, the second term, a sub 2 is equal to 2 thirds, all times a sub 2 minus 1. Well, that's a sub 1, but a sub 1 we're given is 3. So looking at this, I know a sub 2 is equal to 3's cancel, so 2. a sub 3 is 2 thirds times the term right before, a sub 3 minus 1 is a sub 2, which we found to be 2. So a sub 3 is 2 thirds times 2, which is 4 thirds. a sub 4 is equal to 2 thirds all times the term right before, which is 4 thirds. So a sub 4 gives us back 8 to ninths. The fifth term, <clears throat> is 2 thirds times the fourth terms, 8 ninths. So our fifth term here is 16 over 27. So it said list the first five terms. We're given the first term, 3. We found the rest is 2, 4 thirds, 8 ninths, and 16 27ths are the first five terms. 
of that sequence. So the next question also deals with sequences. We're given a list of terms in a sequence, three, three halves, three fourths, three eighths, three sixteenths. It wants us to answer the following question. Find the general formula of the nth term of the sequence. So let's see if it's arithmetic or geometric. Depending on if it's arithmetic or geometric, we could figure out what that is from there. Or we can look at any pattern that's going on. Maybe let's try that. So a sub n is equal to, notice our numerator is always three here, all over our denominator. So our denominator is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. So that looks like I'm looking at 2 to the nth power, or 2 to some power. But if I started out n equals 1, 2 to the n would be 2. I don't want it. I want to be have 1 down there at the beginning. So 2 to the 0 power is 1. So let's write it as 2 to the n minus 1 power. So we found the nth term of the sequence. It wants to determine if this is arithmetic or geometric or neither. If the sequence is arithmetic, find the common difference. Or if the sequence is geometric, determine the common ratio. So looking at this, <clears throat> I can tell that it is geometric, but let me show that it's geometric. So to be geometric, if I take a term, so let's say a sub n divided by the term right before it, a sub n minus 1, this better give us some constant r. So a sub n I have above. So this is 3 all over 2 to the n minus 1 power divided by a sub n minus 1. So 3 all over 2 to the n minus 1 power. And then, oops, n minus one power, and then we're subtracting one. So looking at this, we have three to the two n minus one power times the reciprocal of the denominator. So we have two to the n minus two power over three. Our threes cancel. I can use my rules of exponents. I have the same base in the numerator denominator. So I can take the base two, our numerator n minus two minus the exponent in our denominator n minus one. So doing that, we get two to the this is a negative n plus n is zero, a negative two minus a negative one. So negative two plus one is negative one. So we get, this is one half, this is equal to a constant. So this is our common ratio of our geometric sequence is one half. So find the general formula of the arithmetic sequence where the seventh term is 31 and the 20th term is 96. So I'm given that it's arithmetic. There's three different formulas for an arithmetic sequence. I'm gonna look at the one that a sub n is equal to the first term plus n minus one times d. So the seventh term this is where n is equal to seven. So let's go in there and plug in seven there. So I have a sub seven is equal to the first term plus seven minus one, all times d. But a sub seven, the term is 31. So I have 31. 
is equal to a sub 1 plus 6d. So I have one equation, two variables. Now let's set up the other equation. We know the 20th term, so n is 20 here. The term is 96. So we technically have 96 is equal to the first term, a sub 1, plus n minus 1, 20 minus 1, times d. So I have 96 equals a sub 1 plus 19d. So we have two equations, two unknowns. We can solve this using systems of equations. If I look at, let's say that this is two, this is equation one. Let's look at maybe negative, or how about row two, or equation two minus equation one. Okay, so equation two, I'm gonna leave it there. Let's multiply equation one by negative one. So if I multiply everything through by negative one, I get negative 31 equals negative a sub one minus 6d. So if I sum these, these equations together, 96 minus 31 is 65 is equal to a sub one's cancel. 19d minus 6d is a 13d. Divide both sides by 13. So 65 divided by 13 is 5. So we know what our common ratio is, which is 5. We have two equations. Let's plug it into one of the equations and figure out what a sub 1 is. So let's go in and plug it into this first equation. So we have 31 is equal to a sub 1 plus 6 times d, but d is 5. So I have 31 is equal to a sub 1 plus 6 times 5, which is 30. Let's get a sub 1 by itself. By subtracting 30, we get a sub 1 is 1. So the nth term of our sequence is a sub n equals the first term 1 plus n minus 1 that quantity times d, so times 5. Number 12 says graph the following rational function. Make sure that you graph the asymptotes and find the intercepts. So looking at this, I would factor both my numerator and denominator first. So looking at this, I have f of x. This is equal to my numerator factors. It's a difference of squares. So it's x minus 1, x plus 1. My denominator is also a difference of squares. So it factors as x squared minus 4, all times x squared plus 4. I see that my denominator factors a little further. So I'm going to rewrite my numerator, x minus 1, x plus 1. My denominator, x squared minus 4, factors as x minus 2, x plus 2. My factor of x squared plus 4 does not factor over the real numbers, so I'm going to leave it like that. Looking at this, I can tell that I have vertical asymptotes. My vertical asymptotes occur at values which are setting my denominator equal to 0. And if I had any like factors, um, it would just be remaining to keep my denominator zero, but I don't have any like factors. These are vertical lines, so write them as equations of vertical lines, x equals two and x equals negative two. Looking to see if I have a horizontal asymptote or a slant asymptote, I'm looking at the degree of the numerator and denominator. The degree of the numerator is two, degree of the denominator is four. Since the degree of the denominator is larger, there is a horizontal asymptote, and it's at y equals 0. If I plug in 0 for x, if I look at f of 0, I can find my x-intercepts, I'm sorry, my y-intercepts, and that would give me negative 1 over negative 16, which is 1 16th. If I wanted to find my y-intercept, that's when my function is zero. So 
f of x is 0 is equal to x minus 1, x plus 1. All over my denominator, but if I multiply both sides by my denominator, that clears it out because 0 times the denominator is 0. And so I can see my x-intercepts are going to occur at x equals negative 1. So negative 1, 0, and positive 1, 0. So graphing what we have so far. We have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. We have a vertical asymptote at x equals positive 2. We have a horizontal asymptote on the x-axis, y equals 0. We have y-intercepts at negative 1 and at positive 1. So I want to see what's happening on either side of my asymptotes. So let's plug in a number, let's say negative 3. I'm really curious, is that going to be above or below the x-axis? If I plug in negative 3, I get 9 minus 1 is positive. And if I plug in a negative 3 to the fourth power, that's 81 minus 16, which is positive. So I'm going to be above the x-axis here. So I know because of where my x-intercepts are, I'm not going to cross the x-axis on this side of x equals negative 2. And that I'm above the x-axis, my shape is going to look like the following. Let's look at what's happening on the other side. So let's say positive 3. Same thing, I would get a positive divided by a positive, so I'm above the x-axis. Same reasoning, I know that there's no x-intercepts on that side. And knowing where my asymptotes are, I can see what my graph is going to look like. So now I'm curious of what's going on in between. Well, I know that my y-intercept was at positive 1 16th. So I'm not sure if I'm above or below the x-axis between negative 2 or negative 1 and negative 2. So let's plug in negative 1.5. Negative 1 1.5 is bigger than 1 squared is bigger than 1. So that's positive m in the numerator. 1.5 to the fourth power. Looking at it, um, Plugging n 1.5 to the fourth power, we get 5.0625 minus 16 would be a negative number. So this is below the x-axis um, between negative 2 and negative 1. And then I have a point here at the x-intercept. Um, I also know that it's odd, so it has to cross. So my shape is going to look like this. I could have tested for symmetry. Now looking at this, I can see that this is an even function. f of negative x is equal to f of x. And so this is symmetrical across the y-axis, which if you look at this, looks like it's symmetrical with the y-axis. So for your final, you should be able to tell um, if a function is even, which means f of negative x equals f of x. If it's odd, f of negative x equals negative f of x or neither. Next question is solve the equation 2x to the fourth plus 7x cubed plus x squared minus 7x minus 3 equals 0. So looking at this, we cannot factor it. But we have learned how to find zeros of a polynomial. And so let's look at the zeros of this polynomial. I know that possible rational zeros are in the form of p over q. So my factors of p are plus or minus, um, factors of negative 3, so plus or minus 1 and 3. q are factors of my leading coefficient, which is 2. So factors of 2 are plus or minus 1 and 2. So looking at my p divided by q, I have plus or minus. 1 divided by 1 is 1. 1 divided by 2 is 1 half. 3 divided by 1 is 3. 3 divided by 2 is 3 halves. So now I'm going to use synthetic division and the remainder theorem to find my zeros using synthetic division. So let's plug in 1. 
and test to see if that's a zero. So using synthetic division, let's put our coefficients in the order from descending power and put a zero if there's any term missing, but there's not in this case. Bringing down our first number two, one times two is two, seven plus two is nine, one times nine is nine, one plus nine is 10, one times 10 is 10, negative seven plus 10 is three, one times three is three, negative three plus three is zero. So I'm happy because I got a zero there. So that tells me X equals one is a zero. But it also tells me X minus one is a factor. The bottom row is also a factor. It's one degree less than the degree we started with in the synthetic division, which was degree four. So this here is 2x cubed plus 9x squared plus 10x plus 3. So looking at that, it doesn't look like it's factorable. So I would continue to go in my process. I notice my p divided by q are the same, so I don't eliminate anything by going down a degree. Um, I noticed that if you look at the bottom row of this, it's in all positive numbers when this was positive here. So by the upper bound theorem, there's no other number bigger than one that would be a solution there. So it's possible one half is, but one won't be three or three halves. Okay, so I'm going to go and I'm going to try integers. So let's go to negative one and see if negative one works. I'm going to use that bottom row so I can just keep decreasing the degree. So two, nine, 10, three. So if I bring down two, negative one times two is negative two. Nine minus two is seven. Negative one times seven is negative seven. 10 minus seven is three. Negative one times three is negative three and zero. So I know that X equals negative one is a zero. And I also know X plus one is a factor. My bottom row is one degree less. And so I have a cube, this will be a square. So this is two X squared plus seven X plus three. It's quadratic, I can find the zeros by quadratic formula, or I can see if I can factor it. I'm gonna do trial and error. So let's do this as plus three plus one. Um, just checking to make sure that this is correct. 2x times x is 2x squared. My middle term, I'm going to get a 6x plus a 1x is 7x. And my last term, 1 times 3 is 3. Okay, so we have our polynomial factored. So we're factoring this as x minus 1, x plus 1, 2x plus 1, x plus 3, this is equal to zero. So we're setting each factor equal to zero to solve this equation. So x minus one is zero when x is one. x plus one is zero when x is negative one. Two x plus one is zero, subtract one, divide by two. So we get x is negative one half. And x plus three is zero when x is negative three. So we have four zeros which makes sense because it's a degree four in the fundamental theorem of calculus or algebra, not calculus, um, says that we would have that many zeros counting multiplicity. Notice those are all numbers of our form P divided by Q because those are all rational numbers and they showed up. So solving that equation, we used facts of polynomials and finding zeros of polynomials to help us solve that equation.